Let not your heart be troubled. You are listening to the Sean Hannity Radio Show Podcast. So like many of you, I have trouble sleeping. I have insomnia. No matter what I tried, it wouldn't work until I met Mike Lindell and I got my very own My Pillow. It has changed my life. What makes My Pillow so different is My Pillow's patented adjustable fill. In other words, you can adjust the patented fill to your exact individual needs so you get the support you need and want to help you get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer. Just go to MyPillow.com or call 1-800-919-6090. Remember, use the promo code Hannity. When you do, Mike Lindell will give you his best offer ever. Buy one pillow and get another one absolutely free. My pillow made in the USA, 10-year unconditional warranty, and it has a 60-day, no questions asked, money-back guarantee. You have nothing to lose. So it's time for you to start getting the quality of sleep that you've been wanting and we need. Just go to MyPillow.com or call 800-919-6090, promo code Hannity. Take advantage of Mike's special two-for-one offer, MyPillow.com, promo code Hannity. All right, happy Friday. Glad you are with us. Write down our toll-free telephone number. We'd love you to be a part of the program. It's 800. It's 941 Sean. if you want to join us. You know, I'm looking. The RNC, the White House, they are fighting back now hard on this book by Michael Wolf that has created such a buzz and a controversy. And they actually put out a new cover of the book. It's Fire and Fury is the name of the, the book. And... Uh, What they have is liar and phony. They quote Maggie Haberman of the New York Times. He gets basic details wrong. Mike Allen and and some other people at Axios saying wrong and sloppy and Salon saying may not be super reliable. And, uh, you know, and it goes on from this sloppy, slop, too stupid, malicious for words. Uh, I just, you know, know from the little bit that I've read that was said about me, I haven't read the book yet. But I actually had pages texted over to me just earlier today, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, that's just not true. And I have no idea why um, Michael never called to clarify. Um, I only met him once, and it was on a plane ride down to Roger Ailes' funeral, and he talks about that a little bit. But, he, you know, just what he's saying here about me just isn't true. You know, the funny part is, is that, oh, Hannity would be willing to give questions to the president. We'll go with him. And I'm like, I don't even write questions. I, so, Linda, what do I do before these interviews? T- tell everybody. You you see it. My TV producers were laughing about it because they see me writing and nobody can read a word of what I write, including myself. It just helps yeah. me. You focus. missed your calling. You should have been a doctor because I don't know what you're <laughs> writing. I have no idea. what. But you're they're saying. not questions. No, right? I, they're, I only write like they're words. They're reference points. Yeah. Like immigration. OK. Like and then immigration, that's point. DACA, economy, policy. Exactly. I mean, even your texting is like that. And then I'm like, I don't know what this means. No, no, no. It's, a, it's an art form to understand how I text. Yeah. You're you're the Picasso of non-communication when it comes to chicken scratch. <laughs> what do you it's mean the good. Picasso of non-communication? Because I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Just like I don't understand Picasso's artwork. I don't understand your chicken scratch. It's like you mean only you don't you understand, understand Picasso's. So you, there's no depth to your inner soul to see the, the beauty of the lifestyles of the rich and famous. were not the from varying me, squares that that bring into the depth of the mind and the heart and the body in the soul Correct. of the, I'm not of having the champagne subject and brave, of whom I'm Picasso perhaps is self-portrait. Huh? I'm not having champagne and caviar wishes. I'm having beer and cheese Whiz. It's a very different approach. You know? <laughs> Pizza and cheese Whiz. Do people really eat cheese Whiz? Is that like cheese a big Whiz thing? on a Triscuit is some tasty stuff. No, nah, you know, I'm not a big cheese. I am a big Kraft macaroni and cheese guy, though. You oh, want to talk I about love my... mac and cheese. Uh, but it can't be the powder kind. It's got to be the, the orange gooey nonsense. I like the Stouffer's one. That's orange and gooey. No, it's not as good as it's not as good as craft. But back to your point, you do not write questions. I know that's you funny. Write words and you scribble hey, things and you. Put you know what them the funniest envelope. thing is? I look down my my own notes and I'm like, I can't even read this. And I and I've done it my whole career. What's wrong with me? You would think I'd maybe type them out ahead of time. There is such a thing as a laptop and a printer, and I can use it, and I don't. Oh, you can't make this stuff up. Well, I think you know the interesting thing is is that the. You know, the buzz, the book is now beginning to fade in light of uh, so many people realizing. I mean, how does he how can you not do a simple check? I mean, even the New York Times Sunday magazine called me 17 times. Uh, Were you really born on Oaks Drive in Franklin Square? Yes. You were born on December 1961. Yes. That's really your picture. That's you as a baby. Yes. They fact check. Yeah, but you're missing the the greatest point of, of all is that the intro to Wolf's book 
Oh, I got it here in front of yeah, me. Yeah, why don't read you it? read that? That's the crazy part. It says, many of the accounts of what happened in the Trump White House are in conflict with one another. Many, in Trumpian fashion, are badly, uh, are baldly untrue. Those conflicts and that looseness with the truth, if not with reality itself, are an e- elemental thread of the book. Sometimes I have let the players offer their versions, in turn allowing the reader to judge them. In other instances, I have, through a consistency in accounts and a thorough sources I have come to trust, settled on a version of events I believe to be true. You know, let me tell you what that is. I know some of you want to sue me, so I'm basically saying uh, it may not be true anyway. Never mind. And that's what everybody that's what now is taking the media's attention away from where they were just, you know, 60 hours ago, telling the world that we're on the verge of nuclear war with Iran to where, oh, now they're focused on the book, the book, the book, the book, the book. I don't care about a stupid book. I, I didn't from the beginning. You know, I think the only troubling aspect is maybe what Steve Bannon said. I didn't hear that Bannon has at this point said I did never said that. I've heard him praising the president in the recent days, but, I, you know, he's going to have to speak for himself on all that. All right. The big news of today are two things we broke on TV last night, and they're massive. Now, I have been saying for the longest time journalism in this country is dead. I've been pointing out examples all week long. The president on Monday is going to give out his fake news media awards. We're going to do it tonight on TV just for fun. And we've got more tape to prove a point than anyone could ever want. I could spend literally 24 hours pointing out one fake news example after another, one conspiracy theory debunked after another, because that's all news has become today. They don't talk about the great economic news of the week that we spent a lot of time talking about on this program. They don't talk about what is the real danger to the students in Iran that are literally risking their lives as we speak and any minute you know, or hour or day now, some of them, thousands perhaps, could be mowed down as they fight for their freedoms. That doesn't seem to get on the radar of most of the people in the mainstream media. Or that, oh, well, the North Korean murdering dictator thug, little rocket man, has a a button on his desk that he's threatening the United States States with, and God forbid President Trump didn't decide to go down the the path of, of failed policies of his predecessors like Clinton, and Obama and try to bribe these thugs and dictators. And somehow that makes Trump a bad person because Trump refuses to capitulate to North Korea and Iran. I think the only thing that would make them happy is if he got down on his knees and said, oh, please, please, pretty please with sugar on top. I'll even throw in $150 billion. Please like us. Because that's the only foreign policy they seem to appreciate because they loved Obama and they loved Clinton when both of them made their deals respectively. You know, Obama with uh, Iran and the mullahs of Iran and, and Clinton with North Korea. You can't bribe dictators into being human beings and wanting true peace. It's failed before. It'll fail again. And this capitulation to evil that is so popular and widespread is, is spectacularly stunning, especially in light of the last hundred years of human history where 100 million people have died. You know, how do you how do you dispute What is now known facts, you know, think of man's inhumanity to man. If little rocket man is threatening to press the red button, he better know there are consequences for those actions. And that's all Trump did was say, yeah, well, we've got bigger weapons, more weapons and ours work. So you better be smart. But he's not bribing them. He's not sucking up to them and he's not bowing before them or kissing the ring before them which I don't understand. But anyway, the big stories. Now, we have spent time, and this is where the media now has spent a year lying to you about Trump and Russia and collusion with zero evidence emerging. Well, what about what happened to General General Flynn? Okay, lied to the FBI. So they say, made agreed to a, a plea deal. And I'm pretty certain because they said, well, otherwise we're just going to put your kid in jail. And what father wouldn't say, all right, I'll agree to it, even though I know it's not true. That's what you get for 35 years of of patriotic service for your country. And Paul Manafort's issues have nothing to do with Russia at all whatsoever. Nothing to do with his time with Donald Trump at all. 
Anyway, I keep pointing out that we have a dual justice system in this country. Now we have finally, after a year of of literally peeling an onion back layer by layer by layer and night after night and day after day and week after week. Now we're beginning to see the full picture. For example, on the Hillary Clinton email server scandal, you know, the server that she put in a mom and pop shop bathroom closet that foreign intel agencies got a hold of. That one that was not secure, that one that had secret, top secret, special access program, the highest level of intelligence on the computers that foreign entities got a hold of. Well, now we find out after we discovered the fix was in with James Comey and Peter Strzok, and they're writing an exoneration before an investigation even occurs. Finally, now where you have the Daily Beast reporting the Department of Justice has now reopened that investigation into the Clinton email server scandal. And John Solomon broke a huge story yesterday. Now the FBI is opening a brand new investigation into the Clinton Foundation, specifically the FBI seeking to determine whether or not any pay for play occurred while Hillary Clinton was serving as secretary of state. Well, that goes right to the heart of the Uranium One deal. Even the Washington Post, it's not their lead, but it's it certainly, you know, for the, it certainly gets my attention. They're a little late, a little way behind the curve than we have been, as they usually are in the media. They're only covering it now because they have to, not because they did deep, hard digging investigative journalism. That would be John Solomon. That would be people like Sarah Carter and people like Greg Jarrett and others. Anyway, the FBI, according to the Washington Post, has been discreetly investigating the Clinton Foundation for months and reviving a probe that was dialed back during the 2016 election amid tensions between the Justice Department prosecutors and FBI agents about the politically charged case, according to people familiar with the matter. Why would you do that? Why, in the case of the email server, you know, weren't the local FBI agents involved in doing the investigation. Why did she get a special status in that particular case? The evidence is overwhelming and incontrovertible on the email case. Now that we know investigations are ongoing, if I'm Hillary Clinton today, and I'm Uma Abedin today, and I'm Cheryl Mills today, I'd be very nervous about where all of this is going to end up. Because her buddy James Comey is no longer the head of the FBI. And at this point, she may still have friends. You know, Rod Rosenstein, who knows? She's got people, friends everywhere. The deep state has no end. It's like a bottomless pit in Washington. But when we get to the bottom of this, James Comey is going to be, he's not going to be lecturing anybody on ethics and morality on Twitter much longer. Because he's the one that put the fix in. And nobody runs an investigation. You send it to your local FBI field office They do their job. Then you make the determination after you do the investigation. And you might want to interview the witnesses first. And, you know, and I will tell you that on the Uranium One deal, person that's probably has one of the biggest problems and and a lot of questions to answer is Robert Mueller himself. And Robert Mueller knew about Putin wanting to get a foothold in the uranium industry in America. He knew all about it. And he knew because we had a guy on the inside, an FBI informant. That FBI informant's about to talk to congressional committees. I've been telling you, these cases are about to blow wide open. Everything we've been covering and the media has not been covering. All right, as we roll along, Sean Hannity Show. All right, two big breaking stories today. Hillary Clinton under investigation, now confirmed. The Department of Justice reopening the investigation into the Clinton email server. John Solomon's reporting, now even the Washington Post reporting. The FBI has opened a brand new investigation on the Clinton Foundation. Specifically, they're looking to determine whether or not pay-to-play was used or occurred while she was serving as Secretary of State. How do you not get to that? I mean, if you're investigating this, I, you know, this is the, the real danger, as I've been saying. You know, with all the media just fixated on one f- focused topic, which is taking out Donald Trump, and a, a, a real belief, first off, that he never had a chance. It was laughable to them that he was going to run. It was laughable any thought that he could get the nomination. It was laughable that he could become the next president. And so then he's elected. And on election night, November 8th, 2016, there is a state of shock 
collectively in the left wing media in this country. I mean, you look, they look stunned. Deer in headlight looks not believing what they're even reporting. And then it becomes a long winding road now through a year of delegitimizing and doing everything possible to stop the president from achieving the agenda that he wanted to achieve. And in spite of that, look at the year 2017 turned out to be. Took a while to get Republicans on board because they're kind of weak and feckless. And by the way, this is their best opportunity to get their identity back if they want to get their identity back. This, to me, would be the year that, yeah, maybe they should do welfare reform. Maybe they should finish the job. I know they get rid of the Obamacare mandate and the tax bill. But maybe they should take it a step further and offer health care solutions and health savings accounts and, and maybe other ideas that have been discussed and debated and talked about for 15, 20 years. Maybe health care cooperatives like our buddy doc, Dr. Josh Umber down in Wichita, Kansas. You know, there are solutions to problems. Biggest challenge now for Republicans. Look, everyone's going to say, well, this is a distraction. I was debating Geraldo last night, and he's like, I don't want to see the president get bogged down in any of this Clinton stuff. I'm like, it's not about the president here. It's about whether or not laws were broken. And if laws were broken, and clearly they were, then there's got to be consequences for her behavior. You know, the fact that you had a hot, the FBI director writing an exoneration and didn't investigate or e- even interview the main people and, uh, that are the target of the investigation, it's mind-numbing to me. It's more than mind-numbing. It's corrupt. And if that's not obstruction of justice in its own way, I don't know. It's like destroying, you know, emails uh, servers with acid washing bleach bit and busting up blackberries. All this now is coming to light. We'll get to your calls on this Friday next. 800-941-SEAN. You want to be a part of the program. All right, 25 till the top of the hour. 800-941-SEAN. You want to be a part of the program. It's actually amusing to watch the media in their attempt to try to now catch up. And I mean, you know, it, look, there's very few of us that have been out there that have been saying, hey, guys, Look at this. Crimes were committed. This is corrupt. This is really bad. Now, we've done it on this radio show. We've done it on Hannity, on on the TV show, on the Fox News channel. You've watched John Solomon and Sarah Carter and Victoria Tunsing and Greg Jarrett and, and Jay Sekulow and, 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 and Tom Fitton. I'm trying to get everybody in that's really been working, working hard with a Sidney Powell. Linda, who am I missing here? I want to make sure everyone gets the credit they deserve because it's been a process of unpeeling layers of an onion. And, so, you know, Mike Myers is a very good friend of mine, and he wrote me an email the other day, but you never get to the conclusion of this thing. (laughs) And I'm like, we're getting there. We're getting there. And now, you know, when NBC and the Washington Post are finally forced to acknowledge that which we have been saying for a long time is coming, it gets pretty interesting because it's not, their first choice of news, I, I doubt their news coverage is going to go where their web coverage is going. Now, NBC News has finally reported that the FBI's Clinton Foundation investigation is, yes, it's been going on for months. Now, back in November, I told you that uh, the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, did not recuse himself from the Uranium One issue. Well, that's where the pay-for-play issue comes, you know, front and center. Anyway, the headline is a Trump administration official said Friday that a revived investigation of the Clinton Foundation has been going on for months. John Solomon broke this story yesterday, reporting FBI agents from Little Rock, Arkansas, recently conducted an interview with a potential witness. The paper said the Justice Department has launched a new inquiry into the foundation. By the way, what the sources I'm hearing, my sources, Hannity sources, I hear that the amount of money that went into that foundation that wasn't reported is staggering. It's mind-numbing. And where the money came from is even more staggering. Remember, nobody in the media wanted to pay attention that Hillary was taking money from countries that practice Sharia law and countries that abuse women. Women couldn't drive in many of these countries. They... Marital rape wasn't a crime in many of these countries. They couldn't travel abroad. Some women couldn't work and go to school. And Unbelievable. Gays and lesbians thrown off buildings. 
hung in a public square. She's taken money from them, and yet she claims she's a champion of human rights, champion of gay and lesbian rights, women's rights. She didn't have any problem taking their money. I wouldn't take their money. I don't want their money. How about they start treating people like human beings? Anyway, so now we know, back to the uh, NBC report, Republicans in Congress have been repeatedly urging the attorney general. I have sources that I talk to in the Justice Department, and they have been saying that there's a lot more happening than anybody knows. That's all I've been hearing. But it, it gets frustrating, and I know the wheels of justice grind slowly, unless, of course, your name is Donald Trump. <laughs> then you just hire the most corrupt, anti-Trump, pro-Hillary Clinton people you can find. Anyway, a November 13th letter to members of uh, Congress from Steve Boyd, the DOJ's assistant attorney general for congressional affairs, said Sessions had directed senior prosecutors to examine the status of several issues, including whether any matters currently under investigation require further resources. That language, the administration official said today, referred to, among other things, the Clinton Foundation investigation. Now, what I'd like an answer to, why was it dialed back in 2016? Do you realize that if James Comey, if you look at the original drafts of his memo regarding Hillary Clinton, where I think it's like nine separate times he says gross negligence, which is the legal standard, where he literally had penciled out that it had been had that Clinton server had been hacked by foreign entities. You know, if he hadn't called it a matter as directed to do so by Loretta Lynch on uh, when he talked to Loretta Lynch. Well, it's not an investigation. It's a matter. Or the, you know, the corrupt meeting that took place there. Do you understand that if Comey at the time looking at the time frame when he's writing this exoneration during what we now know was a rigged primary that Hillary had rigged the whole thing in the DNC. And thanks to Donald Brazil, we know a lot of this. But if you think back, if that had happened, Hillary wouldn't have been on the ballot. Why does one man get to circumvent the law, rig a, an investigation just like she rigs everything else? Clintons rig everything. They even tried to rig a general election. They rigged the primary with Bernie. They rigged this investigation. They had James Comey and Loretta Lynch on their side, then Peter Strzok on their side, and Lisa Page on their side, and apparently Bruce and Nellie Orr on their side. You got the highest people in power here. It's mind-numbing how corrupt at the highest levels some people are in this country. She wouldn't have been the candidate. She would have been indicted. But rather than do follow the law, and apply the law equally, he made the decision, along with obviously a few others that were on his side, on Clinton's side, not to apply the law to her. And that's what happened here. And when Comey and Strzok are reworking this exoneration letter before they even interviewed the main people, then the, 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 whole, the whole thing was rigged. And you could say, well, there's been so many. There wasn't an investigation. Remember, Congress couldn't get everything turned over. We couldn't get the 33,000 deleted emails, et cetera. It's interesting now the Washington Post and now NBC News are catching up to Sean Hannity. It's like the rest of the media hated they had written my obituary if Donald Trump lost the election. Anyway, uh, the House Intelligence Committee chairman, Devin Nunes, has now expanded the Russiagate investigation to include... One of the top prosecutors on special counsel Robert Mueller's team, according to a letter sent to the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein. By the way, I heard Rod Rosenstein was begging Paul Ryan earlier this week, pretty much on hand and knees, not to turn over these documents to Devin Nunes and his committee to do his job of his oversight. Maybe somebody wants to explain to Rod Rosenstein that we have something called checks and balances in this country. Anyway, Nunes had demanded an all-star lineup of witnesses, interviews for the month of January, including the FBI supervisory special agent Peter Strzok and his mistress, the FBI attorney Lisa Page, and the DOJ associate deputy attorney General Bruce Orr. Remember, Bruce Orr is meeting with people from Fusion GPS 
both before and after the election. His wife, Nellie, was doing the op research for Fusion GPS. Can't get any more incestuous than this. Anyway, Nunes also wants the DOJ to turn over 9,500 text messages between Strzok and Page. Remember, we only got 350 of them. Nunes added, I understand your office is researching records related to the details of an April 2017 meeting between the DOJ attorney, Andrew Weissman, now the senior attorney for the special counsel, Robert Mueller, and the media, which will also be provided to this committee by uh, by the close of business Thursday, January the 11th. Now, Weissman is the Mueller prosecutor who is said to have orchestrated that no-knock pre-dawn raid on Paul Manafort. That's his M.O. That's who he is. You know, Manafort's bail is twice that of Bernie Madoff, for crying out loud. You know, we're not talking about other people's monies at risk here. You know, this Farco law that they talk about, well, it's been on the books for 200 years, and nobody, five people have been prosecuted, only one successfully. Usually you just let people, if they didn't do the proper registration, to just update it and get it done. Weissman's the same guy that was involved in the Anderson accounting case. Now, why is that relevant? Well, because he brought an obstruction of justice case in that instance, and tens and tens of thousands of people lost their jobs as a result. And then the whole case was overturned. The whole obstruction case was overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court 9-0. This is Robert Mueller's lead guy. And then, of course, he had the other instance where he put four Merrill Lynch executives in jail for, for a year. Well, that was overturned, too, by the, Sif, uh, by the Fifth Circuit Court. Pretty amazing. And then you look at, I'm not even talking about the rest of Mueller's team. If I was James Comey, I'd get a lawyer today. That goes for Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and... You know, I think Robert Mueller's got some explaining to do. Why did he pick all these anti-Trump, pro-Hillary Clinton people? Couldn't find one Republican of the 16 original people he hires? Not one? Why did Robert Mueller, he had an insider in the in the Putin network that was trying to get a foothold in Uranium One. Why did Robert Mueller not use this information Knowing crimes are being committed, bribery and extortion and kickbacks and money laundering, why didn't Mueller stop Cepheus or at least inform them? Or did he? About the Uranium One deal. Maybe we'll get answers to those questions, too. The Senate Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grassley has recommended the Justice Department investigate for possible criminal charges. The author, Christopher Steele, of that famous dossier, that's moving forward, too. This marks a major escalation in the challenge to the FBI's credibility at the top ranks, not the rank and file, not the field agents. These are the top guys, as they've been investigating any of President Trump's associates. Well, to me, when you have Hillary Clinton and the DNC that she's running, buying Russian lies and propaganda to influence the American people, before an election, that sounds like collusion to me, paying for Russian lies. Well, I thought that was a big, horrible thing. Not if you're Hillary Clinton, but it apparently may be now. And this referral suggests the Justice Department investigate the do- dossier's author. That's Christopher Steele. Because I certainly don't believe the people from that have been stonewalling that have uh, run Fusion GPS and the tactics that they've been involved in over the years. So that's another thing we're going to be watching very closely. But the bottom line is everything that we have been telling you and and all the investigations we've had, it's now moving. That's why there's going to be so this is going to come back and bite so many different people so hard. They don't know what's about to hit them. I know a lot of what's about to hit them. Trying to give you as much information about this as I can without revealing some confidential sources that I have. Oh, you're not a journalist, Hannity. Well, in a lot of ways, I actually am. Doing more journalism than people at CNN, I could tell you that. I was watching Fake Jake last yesterday. Was it Donald Trump's fitness, mental fitness? Is this really what they refer to as news? The most trusted name in news. That the inside of a dog's ear looks like a Donald Trump. 
This is CNN. It's pretty hard to believe, but that's it. By the way, one other move on the, you know, I told you the individual mandate is gone and Anwar was open and drilling in the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Gulf will now continue. But the Trump administration is now moving to allow health insurance to be sold across state lines. This is something that's going to be another huge development and another nail in the coffin of that which is Obamacare. That is a huge story. We also have the Trump administration, the Interior Secretary, Ryan Zinke. He is now drafting a national order, national uh, uh, drafting the National Outer Continental Shelf Oil and Gas Leasing Program for 2009 to 2024. It would make over 90% of the Outer Continental Shelf's total acreage available for leasing, including areas put off limits by the Obama administration. You know how many millions of jobs are going to be created? In the energy sector, it's the lifeblood of our economy. And we rely on countries that hate our guts for what is the lifeblood of our economy. That's a version of insanity. When once we become energy independent, what's the likelihood we have we're less compelled to get into wars that involve the free flow of oil at market prices? All right, when we come back, Sean Spicer's beating himself up saying he's did a bad job. We're going to straighten him out. He did not do a bad job. He dealt with an impossible job with really screwed up people that want to get themselves looking good on TV every night. That's what he was dealing with. I wouldn't take that job for as I, I, you could drop off one hundred and fifty billion like Obama did to the mullahs in Iran. And I wouldn't do that job. So why is this as significant as it is, for example, on the dossier issue and and Christopher Steele? And uh, because if that was used, in other words, think about this. If Hillary Clinton and she running the DNC, they spend 12 plus million dollars for salacious Russian lies. And it ends up being the Hillary Clinton bought and paid for dossier full of lies, propaganda, misinformation that they used to get a warrant, a FISA warrant, on either an opposition candidate, Donald Trump, or a president-elect, Donald Trump. Do you understand how profoundly corrupt that is? Sean Spicer, next. And the excerpts come out, show that there are some narratives that sound that they could be interesting. Uh, but by and large... What do you mean by interesting? That, that it's like there are certain things that I've read that say... Uh, that this event happened and that, that that's plausible. OK, uh, but there's a lot of the quotes that I know are attributed to myself and other people that frankly never happened. If 10 percent isn't true, if 20 percent isn't true, 30 uh. percent, what is the reader supposed to guess what is accurate and what isn't? There were times uh, where I screwed up. There's no question about it. I've Give me one. Before. I, I, uh, I mean, the inauguration, you brought it up. I, I would say that's first and foremost. There was a, an event where I was trying to uh, talk about how evil Assad was. Right. And, and I screwed that up royally. You brought up Hitler, right. Thank you for reminding me. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's, those are days when I went back and, look, I'm a very self-critical person. Yeah. And, and I sat back and said, you know, I, that's... It's not my credibility. I honestly went out every day to do the best job I could for the president of the United States who gave me an unbelievable honor and to basically do the best job I could for the American people because that's ultimately who you serve. And so when I screwed up, yeah, it felt really bad Mm -hmm. because you're realizing that you're you're tarnishing your personal reputation, your family's reputation, your friends who like you and support you, you you know, some of your colleagues and and ultimately, again, this administration and the American people who I wanted to do my best job, my best for every single day. All right, hour two, Sean Hannity Show on this Friday. Toll free, our number is 800 941 Sean. If you want to be a part of the program, that was S.E. Cup interviewing Sean Spicer. I, I, can I take issue with what do you mean you screwed up? Nobody's perfect. I mean, you're not, weren't the perfect press secretary. There's no such thing as a perfect press secretary. And I'm, I'm trying to understand why you're, you're beating yourself up the way you are. And I felt it was unnecessary and, and you're being unfair to yourself. Who wants to deal with a room full of people that hate your guts every day? <laughs> well, that was probably the biggest problem. But first of all, Happy New Year. Thanks happy for New Year. Me on, Sean. Uh, look, I, I mean this. I, I think I was, I, I, I was and I am honored that, that President Trump gave me that distinct honor. And any time that I did something that didn't live up to the standards, that I thought reflected well on him, well on the American people and on, on this administration, all that he's trying to do, um, really, really personally 
graded at me because I know what he did to get to that job. I know what he's trying to do. I know you know that. And any time that I don't think I performed my best, I felt like I let him down. And, Sean, when he called me on December 22nd and said, hey, congratulations, I want you to do this, I made a pledge to him. And I said, Mr. President, you know, thank you for, for Mr. President-elect at that time. I said, thank you for this opportunity. I promise you I will work every day to do my best for you and to reflect well on what you're trying to accomplish for America. And I appreciate your words, Sean, but every time that I did something that took away from the president's agenda, I felt it, it just killed me because I know that he worked his tail off. He spent a ton of money and he had given me this opportunity to help articulate what he was trying to accomplish and why he was trying to do it and the America that he wanted uh, to, 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 to make better. And so, you know, I, I do appreciate your kind words. And I know it, you were always tremendously supportive but when you were getting screwed up because you had one letter wrong or you said something off, and, and you're right, I wasn't perfect. And um, but I always want people to know that, like, it's, it, uh, it, you know, it, it made me feel terrible to think to myself that I didn't, you know, that I did something that distracted from, from the I, agenda. I think everything or, you're describing is a, is an admirable trait. I mean, I think somebody that is thoughtful and introspective and. You know, I, look, I've, I've, we all have insecurities. I've never felt that I've been the best at anything in my whole life, but it, that it's that imperfection that always drives us to try and be better and, and better and better in life. But with all due respect, I mean, there's very few people that I think that are wired to do that job. And in other words, if you're coming in and you are as opposed and there is a vitriol and a hatred that pretty much everybody in that room has for you and the president— and you have everybody in the media pounding on you and then Saturday Night Live pounding on you and and all these other people. I think at some point, you know, it gets very hard and very difficult for you. And oh, I, I, I I mean, yeah, especially yeah. if you're going to agonize, well, I should have said this or I should have said that. Just the amount of preparation that it takes you to walk to that podium every day is exhaustive. There's no question about it. I mean, you wake up every day um, and and basically study cram for an exam is what I would I, I, you know, the analogy I use is you would wake up every day trying to think, where is that? Where are they going to try to stump me? What's the fact that they don't think I know? How are we going to get skewed? But you represent. Wait a minute, but you're saying United something States that's pretty profound here about the whole process. What are they going to try and stump me on? Yeah, now you would exactly. think that they, they want information that they the American people want. You would think like, for example, I don't see people in the media that are reporting on all the economic, the good news in the economy in year one of President Trump. I've gone through the list many times. I don't think you hear them talking about the benefits of the tax bill for the most part. I, you know, they just want to go from ne negative narrative to negative narrative. And the real truth behind the scenes is you're the press secretary and whatever network these people work for, they want to get their time with you. So that little snippet could go on TV and they want to look good and make you look bad. That's all they're trying to do. It's not about helping their audience or serving their audience to know more about Washington. Uh, I couldn't agree more, Sean. And, and you, I've mentioned it to you before. I mean, that's why I'm writing a book is to kind of go through and say that, look, here's what happened. Here's what we were trying to get out. Here's what what was really going on. And here's how it got perceived. I get it. And that's my point, though, is that and I appreciate, you know, your sympathies on this because you woke up every day. And, and my point was the job of the press secretary should be about providing information to a press corps to further communicate it to the American people when the president's not available. That's what it should be. What it's turned into is, is a game of gotcha, a game of trying to figure out how every reporter can get a YouTube click and clip to send out about them trying to stump the chump. And, and if you look at some of the stuff that's, that, 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 that – It's but true. You I, the, everything you're saying – So then it raises the question, what value is there really in this? It's just a dog and pony show. Right, but you look at the questions that they ask. To your point about what they're asking and not asking, the questions that they ask are ridiculous. On any day, look at that briefing and ask yourself the question, is that really informing the American people when they say, Sarah – is the president think his son has committed treason? Give me a break. 
That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But it's every, it's almost had... every question. And then the next guy will right, come right, up and right, they'll right. say, but you didn't answer. Does the president believe he committed treason? Right. Uh, it's stupid. But, 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 the, but the thing is, is that think about this in context. The press secretary gets there between 6 and 7 a.m. every day. The briefing happens between 2 and 3. And this reporter has sat around for probably six or seven hours to ask a nonsensical question like that, that they could have very well just walked up, knocked on the door to the press secretary's office, to the deputies, to the assistant press secretaries, and said, I got a quick question for you. But no, they waited seven hours to ask that question on camera so that they could air it on their nightly news program and look like that they asked some profound gotcha question. That is not about informing the American people, Sean. That's not about furthering an understanding of policy or understanding the agenda. So why that do we do, why creating, do we even do these anymore? What's the point then? I, look, I, you know where I was on this. I, I, I think that there's a role for it. But I, at one point, part of the reason that I suggested doing these off camera for a while is because then they started to actually become a little bit more informative. They were more civil. I agree with you. I think that they have outlived what they were supposed to be for. That when I took this job, I was told, oh, you know what? People will show up for a few weeks, maybe a couple days, you know, and, and they'll be on camera or whatever, and then it'll just die down because everyone loses interest. It has truly turned into a show. And the goal is for all of these people who have lived in obscurity forever to figure out how can I yell at the press secretary loud enough or in an obnoxious way to get myself on television and become a star and get a cable Were contract. they a bunch of phonies behind the scenes sucking up to you and then they get their moment on TV every day? Um, there's a, it's a mixed bag. I mean, there are some really, I, you know, there are some people there um, who do, I, I think, a really good job and who are honest and sincere and will come up and really try to get to the bottom of the story. There are some that I, I don't think fit that category at all. Uh, but I don't want to paint everybody with a broad brush because, you know, there's a few hundred people that gather there on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. Um, and some of them I really enjoyed because I truly thought that they were in pursuit of, of the truth, of good journalism, um, of finding out stories and trying to, to your point, getting what, what am I missing? What do the American people need to know? But I think more and more, by and large, uh, a lot of people who gather there and you look at some of these individuals who've, who have gone from relative obscurity to now CNN commentator or you know, no. MSNBC commentator because their claim to fame is that they yelled at a press secretary. Let me ask you about Michael Wolff's book. Um, from my perspective, I know things were written in there about that book about me that just are not true. Uh, you yeah. know, he may, he told a story about Kellyanne on election day, thinking she's going to lose. I, I I know for a fact that's false. I talked to her that day a lot. Right. Well, and I mean, the same thing. With, I mean, the funny part about this is that if you ask the executives and all the way up to Rupert Murdoch at Fox News, I sat over there and was and briefed the executives at Fox News and explained to them how and why Donald Trump was going to win the path to two seventy. Um, and they were and and I've done that with other folks. Uh, as well. And they're writing these stories about how we thought we were going to lose. They talked about the first lady crying. They talked about how he didn't know who John Boehner was, a golf partner of his who's played along, played, played multiple times with and communicated with quite often. There is a lot of stuff in there that just don't don't uh, make. What do you think specifically basic. about the Bannon stuff? Uh, you know what? Here's the question. Uh, here's where I, I, I deviate on this. What concerns me right now, Sean, is that when you got attacked, you said right now, as you just said, that it's false. When I got attacked, I said that's false. And I'll go head to head and say, this is why that, that's not true or that was taken out of context. You've done the same. What concerns me about the parts about Steve is I have yet to hear now after what has been two or three days, any sense of denial, which concerns me because if I had said anything of the sort in the negative way that he portrayed the president's family or a bunch of the other circumstances or events that occurred at the White House and they weren't true, I would be at the front of the line screaming my head off saying that's not true. Um, that concerns me a lot because I would be out in the front, as you have as well, saying these are the pieces that, were, that are attributable to me that are not true. So I'm concerned about that, and I'm also concerned about the portrayal of some of those events that I equally know are not accurate. And I think and I'm concerned that what they are are his interpretation or, you know, him scheduling some scores uh, 
that, that right, well, are not an accurate representation of what actually happened. Sean Spicer is with us, former White House press secretary, 800 941 Sean, We'll get to your calls at the bottom of this hour. All right, as we continue, Sean Spicer, former White House press secretary, is with us. How do you respond to uh, John Solomon's reporting, now even the Washington Post reporting, that the FBI has been investigating the Clinton Foundation for months, number one. Number two, that the Department of Justice has reopened the investigations into the email server scandal. Thoughts? It's about time. I mean, <laughs> you got to wonder if— You, you, you think? got to wonder— you kind of wonder if, if when Hillary wiped her server, it wiped out a lot of people's Internet connections to search for this stuff, because I'm thinking to myself, what took so long? We pushed this at the RNC pretty strongly. Uh, these are all facts. John Solomon had, has been doing this for a long time. Other really great reporters have been talking about this. Uh, it really, really is. is I, I mean, hey, let, let, and let me just say this. I'm finally glad they're there. So let's be honest that that little late, but glad you're finally there on both fronts. Uh, because uh, some of this pay-for-play stuff is, is extremely concerning. And I think just because you stop running for president doesn't mean that, that you should be free from uh, from investigation. And Why, and why do you think it is that there's been a year's worth of Trump and Russia and collusion and Trump and Russia and collusion? And there, there seems at this point there's zero evidence. Been waiting and waiting and breathless reporting every single day and night, 24 hours a day. And yet you have just incontrovertible evidence that Hillary, in fact, did break the law, mishandled, destroyed, classified information, tried to obstruct justice, destroying, a, a, you know, these servers and destroying blackberries. Then you have the issue of why would anybody allow Vladimir Putin, Putin a foothold into America's uranium market, especially when they knew his operatives were bribing and extorting and money laundering and racketeering and kickbacking, you know, 18 months before CFIUS approved, including Hillary's State Department and Eric Holder. Um, how is it possible, you know, we've gotten in this position that the media ignores all of that? I, I just don't. I mean, I, I really wish I had a good answer for you on this. It, it's amazing to me. I think part of the problem is, I mean, on the Trump front, it's no. I mean, I think this is just this is just the media literally got it so wrong in November that they respond to an excuse because God, goodness knows. They couldn't be wrong if there was if there wasn't a good reason for it. They could have no no way they could have missed a story this big, and they could have been wrong because they had coronated Hillary, and so there's got to be some reason. And they clung onto this Russia collusion story, and and I think what we're continuing to see is a year later we have nothing. Um, and I think that you know, as the president has said before, the the sooner we can wrap this up, and and I, I would say that. The sooner in which everything has been exhausted so that there are no more excuses off right, gotta, for it. On, on the Hillary stuff, look, I, I don't know, but I'm just at least glad they're there. All right, Sean Spicer, st- take your foot off your own neck. You did great. Don't worry about uh, it. Well, thank you. All I right, need we to appreciate talk to you more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would tell you, you, you know, you, you weren't mean enough. You should have or maybe you should have <laughs> done the press uh, secretary job like Bill Belichick gives a press conference. No. Um, yes. <laughs> Not answering. No comment. See you later. Back tomorrow. All right. Appreciate <laughs> Thank it. You, John. 800 941 Sean. We hit the phones when we get back. Straight ahead. Donald Trump, just last week, he confirmed to the National Review that he is again considering a run in 2016. Do it. <laughs> Do it. Look, look at me. Do it. Donald Trump has been saying that he will run for president as a Republican, which is surprising since I just assumed he was running as a joke. <laughs> is that people think that Donald Trump is a clown. Donald Trump, you know, he's a clown. President Obama will go down as perhaps the worst president in the history of the United States, exclamation point, at real Donald Trump. (laughs) Well, at real Donald Trump, at least I will go down as a president. They said basically this is the beginning of the end for Trump. The beginning of the end. Beginning of the end? This is probably starting of the beginning of the end for for Donald Trump. Donald, uh, you're not going to be able to insult your way to the presidency. The strongest person usually isn't the loudest one in the room. So right now we have Hillary's about a 75 or an 80 percent favorite. We have different versions of the forecast you can look at. Oh, has Hillary Clinton up by double digits nationally, 12 points, 50 to 38, four-way race. Clinton leading in Florida, Clinton leading in North Carolina, Clinton leading in Ohio, Clinton leading in Nevada. I could go on and on and on. Uh, I continue to believe Mr. Trump will not be president. 
And so, right now, Mr. Trump, to answer your call for political honesty, I just want to say, you're not going to be president, all right? It's been fun. It's been great. I love you. But, but come on, come on, buddy. We have a major projection right now. Donald Trump will take Ohio. And CNN projects Donald Trump will carry the state of Florida. Huge win for Donald Trump. Donald Trump, while we project, will win in Kentucky, in Indiana, with its 11 electoral votes. West Virginia, Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi, South Carolina, Alabama, North Dakota, uh, with its three electoral votes, and South Dakota, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, the state of Montana, both. North Carolina, Georgia, Iowa, Utah, Wisconsin, Arizona, Kansas with its six electoral votes, Nebraska with its five electoral votes, and Wyoming with its three electoral votes. Sorry to keep you waiting, complicated business. A lot of people have laughed at me over the years. Now they're not laughing so much, I'll tell you. Oh, it's like my favorite tape ever. They never thought it could happen. They never believed it could happen. And now they're trying to undo what happened. And they'll use any means necessary. Lying, distortion, conspiracies, never giving any credit. It's like their drug. What did Trump tweet today so we can hate him even more? And then outdoing themselves. He's so demented. He's really demented. No, 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 no. He's really demented and a a liar, demented liar. Demented liar. Demented. And that's pretty much what you get on morning television and and 24 hours a day on cable. It's uh, it's very entertaining in some ways. All right, let's hit the phones, as promised. As we Again, the big stories today. I mean, do you understand how big this is? The Clinton Foundation now has been has been investigated and we did not know. And the same with the Clinton email investigation is now back open. Comey and Peter Strzok and all their attempts to uh, put the fix in for Hillary before an election. When we get to the rotten core of all of this, the stench is going to be far worse than Watergate ever was. And we'll get there. Kevin is in Weatherford, Texas. Kevin, hi. How are you? Glad you called, sir. Happy New Year. Good. Good. Happy New Year to you. How are you doing? I'm good, sir. What's happening? Oh, well, just uh, wanted to make a comment about uh, old Mr. Bannon and his book. Uh, have had kind of well, thought it's not this his from, book. It's Michael the... Wolf's book. Yeah, he, he was interviewed for it, apparently. Yes, and I kind of had thought this from the beginning that, that this is just my opinion, but, but he, he comes across to me like he thinks he is solely responsible for President Trump's success, where, in my opinion, he was more of a vehicle to get the president's platform out to the people during the campaign. Uh, I know I know where I stand. I voted for President Trump. I support President Trump. I support his instincts, his decision making, and I am 100 percent happy with all of his major victories in just year one. We're just getting started. Look, I'm going to tell you right now, um, I think it's been such a good first year and it's it's amazing that it is left so wide open for shows like this to tell you. And that their obsession, they go from, oh, we're about to have a nuclear war. He said his button's on his desk and it's big and he may touch it one day. Oh, my God. That's not how nuclear weapons are fired, number one. And it was just a response. They, they only, as I proved last night in our monologue, they only seem to like in the media appeasement. They want American presidents bowing, scraping, you know, kissing the rings of, of murdering dictators. And they think, you know, they think and believe in this possibility that you can bribe them. I don't. I think peace through strength is the answer. And I think that we're going to see a lot of movement in the course of the next number of years. And there might be some very difficult, tough moments where we're threading needles and we're on the edge of a razor. But it's got to be done. You cannot allow somebody like Kim Jong-un to hold the world hostage. You cannot allow radical Islamic mullahs in Iran to marry their sick, twisted ideology, their oppression of people, their their killing of innocent people. You can't marry that to nuclear capability. If you do, you risk a worldwide holocaust. Just look at their rhetoric. So I tend to agree with you. Look, uh, as far as what Steve Bannon's contribution, I mean, I don't know. what, What is anybody's contribution? Everybody that voted contributed to Donald Trump's win. I think Donald Trump deserves, you know, a lot of credit himself. It was he, the messenger, following his own instincts, you know, listening when he thought it was worthwhile. But if he disagreed, still stuck to what he believed in. And he was able to overcome tremendous odds and obstacles and, and win the presidency. 
And the amazing thing I think about him at this point is that is that he's keeping to the agenda that he ran on and he's checking off every promise that he's made. And that's what I want in a president. And all these people in the media and on the left that that want him to act and be a certain way, I I hate to tell them this, it's never going to happen. And if it ever did happen, I think the president would lose his supporters. And I think people like his straightforward approach and and his calling it as he sees it. Um, I do. So I certainly I find it refreshing. You know, did Steve Bannon contribute? Absolutely. He contributed to the president winning. Um, did did every voter contribute? Absolutely. I always like to use the analogy. We're all spokes in a wheel and you need every spoke to make that wheel go around in the center of the spoke in this battle to win the presidency was the president himself. And he deserves the most credit. And he's the one that had the courage to run and take all the crap that goes along with running for office. All right. Back to our busy phones. As we say hi to Mitch is in Gold Canyon out in Arizona. Mitch, hey, how are you? Glad you called. Happy New Year. Hey, happy New Year, Mr. Hannity. What's going on? Yeah, sir, I was just going to say, I'm actually an Iraq veteran, small business owner, and a member of the Green Party, and I'm watching all this unfold on the news, and I can't help but see two corrupt parties. I think that when everything bears out, we're going to find out that, as you're saying, Hillary and crew are corrupt and guilty, and I think we're going to find out that Trump was colluding with the Russians and has done an excellent amount of corrupt things, such as interviewing U.S. attorneys. I, I missed the last part. So you're a Green member, you voted for Trump. All right, you're asking no, what no, if No, no, no. I, I I voted for Jill Stein. Okay. So what so I didn't I didn't understand your question. I'm sorry. It wasn't so much a question as a statement. I'm just saying um, I'm listening to you. I agree with you on Hillary. Right. But I disagree right. with you on Trump. I think I'm seeing many indicators of deep corruption. I don't see any corruption. What corruption? Uh, interviewing U.S. attorneys who would be uh, responsible for investigating any of his past or present business practices. Um not uh, stepping aside from his business interests. Uh, well, that's not true. He handed off his business interests to his kids. More or less, but he's still the no, no, I mean, listen, it's not traditionally I, how it's been done. I know enough of what the president is doing every day to know that he's not talking to his sons about, you know, micromanaging his business or having anything to do with it. As a matter of fact, I... I got the impression he's just now totally, completely absorbed in this job and has no interest in his past life job. He just doesn't. He's the type of guy that throws himself into something fully and completely with all of his heart, mind, and attention. That's just how he rolls. Um, that's kind of how you have to roll in, in the life that I'm living here, too. I just I throw myself into my work, what I'm doing, want to live in the moment, do the best job I can. And uh, I don't see any corruption. We've had a year worth of Trump-Russia collusion that has come to nothing, and it's just been a waste of our time. Winter Park, Florida. Thank you, Mitch. Ray is next. Sean Hannity Show. Happy New Year, Ray. What's going on? Sean, happy New Year to you and your family and all your listeners. Thank you. You're missing, you're missing out on sunny Florida. Yeah, okay, rub it in. What's how, how many degrees in Winter Park near Orlando today? 60 and sunny. Beautiful. S- all right, 60 family. is a good six, – usually when I was in Florida over my vacation, it was like 75 every day. We, we've had a little bit of a cold spell here uh, last couple of days yeah. we had to break out the coats, but, but uh, gorgeous. Oh, I'm so here. sorry you had to break out a coat. It took me three hours to drive in a, a massive <laughs> snowstorm, a hurricane snowstorm yesterday yeah. to get to work. We're open everyone <laughs> north. I, I, listen, on the way to work, yes, I probably saw a dozen accidents, spin outs. Um, I don't know why people, if they don't have a car with four wheel drive, would ever think about getting on a road on a day like yesterday. But they do. Yeah. I well, saw at least five cars every- get stuck in New York City because the way that uh, Comrade de Blasio plows the snow, they stick it into, they literally bury in cars if they're parked on the street. And these cars think they could just roll over it and they can't, and their wheels start spinning. Anyway, that's that was our day yesterday. All right, well, enjoy rubbing that- it in. I'm, uh, you know what? I appreciate it. I'll be there one day uh, soon. Dave in North Carolina. What's going on, Dave? How are you? How you doing? What's up, man? How are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. Listen, I'm a first-time caller. I listen to you all the time. Yeah. And I hear about how people give you a hard time about the fact that you have one or five sets of clothing that's exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, Einstein also had five suits that were exactly the same. And the reason was because he didn't want to spend time on what to think about what to wear. That's how I am. I don't want to have to think about what to wear. You know, it exactly. gets. I, I went through this period where I only wore black shirts, cause, and I always wear jeans anyway. So I wear jeans, and I have one pair of shoes, and I have a couple of care, pair of cowboy boots, and a pair of sneakers. And now I have. A, I bought a pair of golf shoes, and that's all I have. 
I'm and like you. Uh, and I don't and I, if I put on my when I'm home I'm in a s- sweatpants and a t-shirt and a baseball hat and when I'm dressed up for work I'm wearing jeans a t-shirt and a black shirt usually but now because everyone was upset about my black shirts now I got all different color shirts that I don't even like. <laughs> Uh, you know, my kids give me a hard time with the fact that I've been buying the same pair of court shoes for the last 40 years. Reeboks Classics. And I love that shoe. And they give me a hard time about it. I'm like, why change something when it works? Yeah, well, I know. I understand it. I mean, they just look at me like I'm a pathetic puppy dog. It's, it's weird. Anyway. Well, I appreciate your show, and I, you guys go 2018. All right, appreciate it. Why are you laughing there, Sunshine? Why does this amuse you so much? I mean, I, f- I find the whole thing hysterical. When he called up and compared hysterical? you to Einstein because you didn't know how to dress, I was like, please <laughs> yeah, go on the air all... and tell him this. Well, it's act is some truth. I don't have to think about what I'm going to wear. Yeah, I'm going to start a new. Com- I'm going to start a new wear. company. I'm going to found found it through a uh, you know uh, legal zoom, and it's going to be called Dressing Men Who Think They Want to Look Like Einstein. It's, I'm not looking like Einstein. I'm not. I'm, well, I'm clearly, not if you have the same five shirts, no, but I think only, you have listen, the same fifteen shirts. You and Lauren look terrific, and and I I've even said to you, you don't have to get dressed up for radio, but you guys. I don't get dressed up for radio. I get dressed up for the people that come into radio. Okay, so okay, you dress very nicely. Ethan's more like me. He's except he's got the plaid top thing going on. Jason's Lionel. got more swag than anybody else on I just the team. wish your hair would become like Einstein's. That would be perfect. Yeah, yeah, that would be great for you. Now that's about a good my hair one. like yours with a blonde mohawk? Oh my god, please get a blonde mohawk, Sean. It'll oh. be the talk of the media for months. Oh yeah, months. that'll be the talk of the no, media. Hannity's it. really only lost it this time. <laughs> yeah, I think so. All right, heading back to our busy phones, then our news roundup information overload hour. Kathy is standing by California. Oh, what a nice tax rate they have in that state, 13.5%. Kathy, how are you? Happy New Year. Hi, doing fine. Happy New Year to you, too. What's going on? Well, yesterday um, I got upset because of the new year and all the new laws and minimum wage going up. And so I thought I'd call my governor and let him know my opinion since he needs to listen to all his constituents. And when I called, I told him the dilemma. I I own two businesses in um, my area. And um, he goes, yeah, people do call in. And I said, well, this is what I want him to know. And he's making it really hard. Um, I'm tempted to leave the state of California. And he goes, okay, well, give him your message and good luck with your future endeavors. And I go, you're telling me to leave? And he goes, just good luck with your future endeavors. And they hung up. Oh, my goodness. Are you serious? I am serious. Dead serious. <laughs> By the way, and, and who's running next? Gavin Newsom? Um, I think. Yeah. You know, look, it, look, <laughs> I know you're now a sanctuary state. It's going to be interesting to watch how that plays out. Uh, if you're not going to obey in the uh, the laws of the United States of America, I would think that the proper consequence would be that California loses money if if they're not going to enforce the laws of the country. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But this battle is now be- beginning to wage in your state. You know, it's just sad that, you know, the people of California, it's one of the country's most beautiful, one of the most beautiful parts of the country. I lived there five years in Santa Barbara. And I got to tell you, it has now become a, a socialist utopia out there. And people just seem to take everything that your government lays on their table. All right. 800-941-SEAN. Toll free uh, telephone number. News roundup information overload coming up next. Straight ahead. And to our detractors that insist that this march will never add up to anything, f*** you. F*** you. I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. I am a nasty woman. I'm nasty, like my blood stains on my bed sheets. All right, news roundup and information overload. Some of the greatest hits from the Women's March a year ago. And uh, D.C. McAllister, who writes for The Federalist, is uh, with us, along with Leslie Marshall, on the other side of this debate. And D.C. has a column out, The Year of Women's Anger Will Only Escalate Unless Women Stop Pretending That They're Victims. Uh, And uh, welcome both of you to the program. Hi, happy new year. Uh, you're not saying, D.C., that w- that women aren't victims. There are plenty of women that are victims. We saw with, with Harvey Weinstein and, and Matt Lauer and his little lock button under his desk. Um, so there, there is a culture where women are victimized. You're saying that this is something different. I 
don't think there's a culture where women are victimized. I think there are individual men who victimize women, individual women. And okay, better way in, to say it. Yes, true. Yeah, and I think in certain spheres it may be encouraged within certain small spheres at certain businesses, not encouraged but overlooked, and even by women themselves, you know, because power is more important than justice in a lot of these areas and has been. And that needs to change, and I'm, I'm glad that's changing. I'm glad that men are being called out for this and that those who have really been abusive to women and assaulted women are being held accountable for what they've done. What I oppose is the idea that women – as a group in this nation, as a quote-unquote marginalized group in some way, a minor, minority group in some way, is a victimized group, that they are somehow don't have all the rights that they want to have, that there's not real equality in this country. They use the term gender parity now, that we just don't have everything that we should have. But I, I think that that's just the, the same old thing that we've heard from feminists for years now. We do have equality, the kind of equality the first and second wave feminists were fighting for. What we don't have is uh, peace between the sexes, and I'd like to see more of that happening. Now, what's your reaction to that, Leslie? Well, I, I agree with some of what she said, and I, I do think we need more peace, but I, I think it, it, it's it's really bigger than that. I think, unfortunately, it would seem since Adam and Eve, uh, women have been um, uh, oppressed by men, whether it's in uh, government, whether it's in jobs, um, whether it's just in a systemic idea that we see in societies, not just in the United States, certainly uh, throughout the world, that for some reason, and, and women, I don't want to say have allowed this, but women have been fearful because of the power that men have wielded over them uh, in employment, uh, in, in the home, uh, and certainly we have seen in government, and, and, this is, and this is worldwide. So I'm hoping that as a woman and the mother of a nine-year-old little girl, that the, the future is different and is brighter, and I, I think women do feel more empowered. I don't think they feel more victimized. I think victimized Victimization, perhaps, is something in the past, hopefully. All right, let me go to the issue that came out by John Solomon in the, in the Hill and has been reported since the new year that we now have apparently an industry that is paying for information, literally seeking uh, women to tell stories against, in, one, in the case of the president, political figures, business figures, political opponents, etc. Mortgages are being paid off. Hundreds of thousands of dollars are being offered and spent on trying to entice people to tell their story. Leslie, I'm sure you would agree if, if, if you're a, quote, journalist and you, it's pocketbook journalism and you're paying people for stories, doesn't that story tend to have less credibility than a story where a news outlet does not pay for it? Isn't that Absolute, generally re- – yeah, what? Yes. Yeah, no, a- a- absolutely. So uh, now you have an industry you know, popping up that is paying off mortgages, offering hundreds of thousands of dollars if you tell us what happened with so-and-so, this person or that person. That is wrong. However, I also think it's wrong, Sean, that when women do speak up, no matter who it's against, uh, you know, somebody in Hollywood or somebody in the White House, um, you, you, ha- you can't just back down. You, you, you have to stay strong and you have to stand there and say, listen, uh, this is what happened. Because if not, what happens is w- women, and we've seen this happen historically, um, are afraid to come forward. And I think that's why people say, look, we'll pay you uh, for telling your stories and being honest, because there are a lot of women who are still very frightened to tell their stories because they're frightened. I think, I think there's a legitimate fear. I'm not disagreeing with you, but does it taint if there's a lot of money involved? Does it taint the credibility of somebody that does come forward? It makes it more questionable, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, when I interviewed D.C., you know, people like Paula Jones and Juanita Broderick and Kathleen Willey and others, I mean, you know, I, I was looking these people in the eye and it becomes a credibility issue. And, you know, I found them all to be highly credible at the time. And it, a lot of it was proven to be true. I mean, Jennifer Flowers was trashed. And then in 98, Bill Clinton admitted after Hillary and Bill had gone on 60 minutes trashing Jennifer Flowers that, in fact, he did have a relationship with her. And, in fact, he did, you know, pay $850,000, lose his law license, and was impeached, you know, over the whole Paula Jones lawsuit. Those are serious consequences for his behavior. But the rest of the media, you know, they're out there saying, well, you drag a, you know, a dollar bill through a trailer park and look what happens. Uh, um, the credibility issue for women is one of the major issues here. I agree with Leslie in that. But we can't water down justice by paying, giving them money. 
um, they say it's for safety, but it's not really for safety or for encouragement. How much? How is one thousand you know dollars going to make a difference for them coming forward? It's still going to be just as difficult for them, and it takes brave women to do this. Well, it's not so one thousand. In some cases, mortgages are paid off, yeah. and in some cases, as high as seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to say something about President Trump. Exactly. And by the way, the only is, days before an election. Yeah, it just throws credibility to the wind. And the problem is, is that we want purity in these kinds of issues so that the real victims are taken care of, that they are able to express their, their stories and that they are able to get justice. But the problem with these issues is it's not just because they're afraid because men are so mean and they're going to rip them to shreds. I mean, that does happen in the political sphere. But there is a, this is a complex web when you start talking about why women don't come forward. And it's not just because they're afraid that they're going to be dragged through the streets. Um, that, that, like I said, can happen in politics. But in every day, it's because these issues were complicated. You know, maybe they were on a date. Maybe they were complicit in some way. And I'm not blaming the victim here, but it is. I have talked to enough of these women to know that it's complicated. Um, maybe they were in a marriage and they shouldn't have been where they were, were not supposed to be. But yet this happened. So well, I watched an interview with There's one woman who was, um, I guess she was accusing Matt Lauer. She was 24 at the time. He was 41. But, quote, as she said, he was, quote, Matt Lauer. Hour. She knew he was married. She admits it's consensual. But then she talked about the power dynamic that he used over her. And it was an abuse of power. Is that a case where you would agree or disagree with? Well, absolutely. When you're in the workplace and you have an, uh, someone in power holding it against you, yeah, you're not going to speak out against that. But what I'm saying is that's not always the case, that we can't just blanketly say women are just afraid to come forward because of the power structures. There's a lot more at play here than just that. There is that element that they don't want to come forward to the HR department. But once you fired. say it's consensual and you're 24, 25 years old and that other person is older, but, you know, 41 years old, at that point, it, 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 and the person continued this and was leaving the network long before that. Um, what do you think, Leslie? <clears throat> Monica Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky. Um, uh, no, but no, no, you can't have it both ways, guys. And this is where... We where didn't say anything. We're, no, nobody where, said anything, where, Leslie. I'm actually agreeing with you. This is where I'm not a Democrat. I'm a woman. Okay, I'm a human being, first and foremost, but I'm definitely a woman before I'm a Democrat. Mother, wife, all of that. And I have to say that um, Bill Clinton was totally wrong using his power, his marriage and, and committing adultery also wrong, but that is between them, in my opinion. Uh, this was a, a young girl in her 20s. He's a very powerful guy. She looked up to him. She was attracted to him, but it was consensual. And the reason that I say that is I, I'm definitely noticing, especially in politics, um, that, you know, we look, you just said, Sean, you looked into the eyes of the accusers of Bill Clinton and you believe them. Have you looked into the eyes of the accusers of Donald Trump? And would you, could you even believe them? Because he's your candidate, and you support I've interviewed. Him. I've, I've offered airtime to every single person, and I've and I've and I've, and and I've interviewed people that were. Wait a minute. Here, they, they should I interviewed women. Hang on. I interviewed women that were in the top fold article in the New York Times, and they contradicted the New York Times story. They said the New York Times embellished and That's took out right, of context every what time they a said. Republican is accused that women are lying, and every time a Democrat is accused. I didn't say. No, the Leslie, truth. don't put words in my mouth. I didn't I'm say out. that. You know, I, I think what I'm really looking for here, because I think these, you know, these instances do happen. And it's got to stop. Uh, I mean, some of these guys are just absolute pigs. And I just think that, you know, I, I, when you add the dynamic of money to it, which is back to my original question, what does that do to the credibility of people that really are victims? Well, exactly. You mentioned Paula Jones, right? What did it do to her credibility um, over Jennifer Flowers? Jennifer Flowers was believed more. Why? Because she wasn't uh, looking for, uh, you know, a paycheck or taking money. A well, lot wait a minute. She filed a legitimate lawsuit. He was her boss at the time. Right. Right. But the, the, the Paula Jones is at least in not just my circles, she but won I think the in a lot of circles with women, wasn't believed because it seemed to be she she wanted a payoff. I'm not saying that she wasn't, so, uh, she, that, that there was all no... All right, but if you're uh, offering no, people uh, money, the, you know, days before a an election, and somebody yeah, accepts Sean, the money... Sean, Sean, money aside, whenever any woman comes forward against a man, regardless of their party, when they're running for something... But how like does the public at that moment say, ascertain what the truth is? Or senator or a but you're not answering my question. Well, how does the public, the voting public, ascertain in two or three days the veracity of anybody in that circumstance? Well, they're doing it right now. I, I mean, with snap judgment. That's the world we live in. 
I mean, how many characters? Uh, but that's know, my point. Uh, what, I mean, if we w- what we want to do is we want to f- separate, you know, those that might do and say things that are not true for political purposes, which probably would be a very few, but from those that have real legitimate cases. And timing certainly is, you know, at that point you ask, well, why is this coming up two days or three days or five days before an election? D.C.? Well, this is the point, is that he, there's actually two different things going on here. There's the real problem of sexual harassment and sexual assault in our country. And then there's also it being used, the whole issue being used for political purposes. And there are two things going on, and we see it being played out in politics today with the Media Matters campaign, is that it's being used, the, the real victimization of some individual women are being used as a broad brush political motivation in order to discredit and delegitimize a whole whole party and men in general. And this is my concern about all this. And you talk about Monica Lewinsky, and my point was that women don't come forward. But she didn't come forward. She didn't want to come forward. She, you know, she had to be coaxed to come forward and say anything because she knew that she was complicit. And it did not mean that what he did wasn't wrong. It was wrong. But it was so laced, it was, in politics, that it was difficult for anyone to really know what was going on. And so we need to separate the women from the politics and the crimes from actually But the goal what just has to be to get to the truth and ascertain the truth. Right. I mean, that's pretty simple. All right. We'll take a break. We'll come back more with D.C. McAllister and more with our good friend Leslie Marshall. 800-941-SEAN. Toll free telephone number. All right. As we continue, D.C. McAllister and Leslie Marshall are with us. All right. So we're talking about the issue of the women's movement, the Me Too movement. What does it mean now going forward? How do you predict this is going to end up, Leslie? Well, I do think we're going to see more allegations coming forward. Unfortunately, to D.C.'s point, I do also think that we're going to see more allegations coming forward um, against politicians, both from the left and the right, quite frankly, uh, that they they want to see fail. Um, And I do want to point out, though... Are you uh, saying questionable allegations or ones that might not be true? Yes. I do. I, I fear. I fear that. I fear that. Um, and 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 especially because of the you know political motivation of, of both sides. And I think that's terrible because it it really hurts the real victims and it would further silence perhaps real victims from coming forward in the future. However, again, you said, don't we want the truth, Sean? And there I agree with you. And we can't just hold have... on. This is a historic moment. I've never uh-huh. agreed with Leslie Marshall. Go ahead. Wait, wait. Make sure we have that on a recording. You play it on a loop every time I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> when I come to New York, you can just like present it to me. You know, <laughs> I think yeah, I'll put it in a gold. On something, my people. I'll will put it in a killed. gold frame. This will never <laughs> happen again. All right, go ahead. All right, I agree with you. We need the truth. This is as far as you're going to agree with it. But we can't have a senator accused and step down on one side, a senator accused on the other, and not step down or step out of a race. It's it's got to be equal across the board. Otherwise, the women are not being given equal treatment for. But the their situations rights. might not be equal. And then that's an insane kind of thing when we're talking about well, justice. Yeah, I don't what think somebody alleging that are not a child. One at a time, D.C. Just, yeah, I mean, to say that we have to always believe the woman and we have to treat everyone the same, if there's an accusation everybody needs to lose their job and step down, this is the kind of thing I'm very concerned about. Just because there's been an accusation doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean that it, everyone needs to run for the hills. And, and it, there needs to be a process and deliberation and a judicious moment taken in order to look into the truth of these matters. And, you know, just because one senator is accused of one thing and another is accused of another thing, the situations might be completely and totally different. One might be completely untrue. You know, one might have happened 50 years ago and the other one might have happened last night. I mean, these are things that we, we are broad brushing this. We're treating them all the same. We're, uh, you know, just bulldozing men and the whole kind of political environment that we have. And it's, it's dangerous and it's being driven by anger and it's being driven by this idea of we're oppressed. And I really right, oppose have... this idea that women are oppressed. They're not oppressed. All right, we're going to leave it there. D.C. McAllister and uh, Leslie Marshall, thank you both for being with us. We appreciate your time. When we come back on this Friday, wide open telephones, 800 941 Sean. if you want to be a part of the program. A special edition of Hannity tonight, the fake news media, how corrupt are they? Wait till you see, and we're doing this because the president's giving out awards for fake news Monday, and we will have an opportunity for you to get in on our ballot. That's tonight on Hannity, 9 Eastern Fox. We made it. Week one is now in the can. Thank God. Oh, rough week already. <laughs> is there enough news for you out there? I think you're going to enjoy. We're having a lot of fun on TV tonight. We're doing a Hannity special on fake news. 
And the president announced that he's going to give out the fake news and most corrupt media awards on Monday. So we kind of wanted to get in on the action and do our own little series and provide an opportunity for you to participate and, and vote on different networks and different uh, on-air personalities and so-called journalists and newspapers. And you get to decide, you know, who's the most who, who gets the award for being the biggest fake news organization in the country. And we'll give a big award out. Maybe we'll invite them on the show and let them defend all their fake news. Uh, anyway, let's get to our phones on this Friday. As we promised, Anthony is in Houston, Texas. Happy New Year, Anthony. Welcome to 2018, the year of the boomerang. Happy New Year, Sean. Happy New Year, Sean. Uh, What's going on? Just uh, had, oh, man, look, just trying to uh, get ready for 2018, which I know is going to be a great year. Uh, being a conservative. Being a great black American, as you are a great uh, Irishman, uh, just trying to weigh in on Trump for the uh, for the for the beginning of the year. I'm glad that he's uh, creating jobs. I'm glad he's uh, getting control over the border, and for sure, as being a businessman, it's looking good for all the small business people, in fact, and especially the minorities and blacks. I really applaud that. Seven-year low black, black unemployment in America. To me, that is a great story. That is, you know, or, yeah. you know, I, the, the fact that two million jobs created in a year, you know, 16 to 20 regulations, you know, obliterated for every new one they take on. All these companies taking the tax cut money, giving it back to their employees, either through raises or bonuses or both. Uh Energy independence literally for the first time in our history is on the horizon. And with it, you know, we're no, we're no longer going to be dependent on countries that hate us. And and as a result, we'll create high paying jobs for millions of Americans, career jobs for people. I mean, all of this is it's like nobody wants to talk about any good news. You know, I, I we've talked about the Bannon Trump feud in the Michael Wolf book. And that's all they want to talk about. But two days ago, they were telling us nuclear war is coming and Trump just started it because he said his button works and and his button is on his desk, just like Kim Jong Un's button. And they were there was faux outrage over all of that. You know, there's there's zero. When I say zero, there is no attention paid to the fact that students protesting in Iran are literally risking their lives and, and any minute now run the risk of being mowed down by these, you know, Iranian uh, special forces uh, on behalf of the mullahs. But they're doing it anyway. I just think there are more important things than the palace intrigue and gossip that is in Michael Wolff's book. That's my take. Well, I'm in agreement, Sean. And what black people have to stop doing is complaining and getting sidetracked with all the issues you just uh, uh, made aware of and get a hold to our economic uh, source. And if we stop blaming everybody else for our downfall, we can see ourselves going further, much further than what we have been with the, with the uh, Democrats and the uh, other Republicans that we had. But I say I applaud Trump because he's a businessman, so he understands businesses. And for sure, with jobs being created, the borders are being maintained, I applaud him. Well, a lot of improvement, and that's prior to, I think, what's going to result in explosive economic uh, growth. I think it was Warren Buffett that says he foresees economic growth for years to come. You know, is that, 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 that's great for men and women that have been left behind. And that's what the election was about. Men and women, forgotten men and women that don't ever even get talked about in the media or in political circles. They have suffered. They have suffered needlessly, and government has caused a lot of that suffering. Unbelievable. All right. Uh, glad you called. Back to our phones as we say hi to uh, Charlotte is in Spokane in Washington. Charlotte, hi. How are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Sean. Thank you so much for taking my call. I really appreciate it. Thank you for I calling. Have a question. I have a question regarding DACA. Okay. The Democrats are pushing the path to citizenship for DACA, the children that came, because they say it's not their fault. But I have not heard the Democrats, what are, is their plan on the parents? The parents did come illegally. If we give the children citizenship, then they get to keep their parents here. Is that correct? Well, you know, that's one of the things um, that has got to be worked out. 
Look, I think this is the biggest political danger for the Republican Party and the president heading into this midterm election year. And it's it's immigration, because I think people are just fed up with the lies. I mean, you know, go back to the 2006 bill and, you know, we always get promised the border security. We're going to build the wall. We're going to take security measures, E-Verify. We're going to end uh, family migration. We're going to end relative migration. We're going to end, you know, this and that. Nothing ever happens. You know, we, right, we, we, you always get You're the correct. tax increase. You never get the spending cut. You always get the amnesty or some type of consideration. You never get the wall built. So I have a simple answer for everybody. Anything that they're going to vote on this year should be secure the border secure the border first and unless and until the border wall is built and the safety measures are in place nothing should happen nothing else should happen and that's my advice to anybody that wants to listen keep them accountable sean please i i I think i do i try every day look i i don't think i could have been stronger on the republican party last year and it did culminate in a in a pretty good tax bill at the end of the year remember that tax bill included opening anwar just yesterday, the president opened up drilling in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Gulf. I mean, we now have energy. We now are on a path of energy independence for this country. We've got to move fast before the left ever gets back in office because they'll try to shut it down probably immediately. But uh, if we're far enough along, hopefully they won't be able to do it. All right, I'll stay on it. I promise. Peter, Connecticut, next. Sean Hannity Show. What's going on? Hey, uh, how you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Good to talk to you. Oh, it's my pleasure. What can say, I do for you? I just wanted to say I'm concerned with all the distractions going on. Uh, the closer we get to any kind of – sorry about the wind. I'm whipping out of the wind. No, nah, no worries. Uh, We're, you must be <laughs> freezing if you're out in the wind in, in Connecticut. What do you do? I drive a truck. Why are you outside? So, uh, get in the truck. Get back in the cab. I just got back in. Hey, uh, I just wanted to say, the closer we get to any kind of uh, arrests or anything, I'm just worried about a false flag attack because uh, everything going on with Korea. And I always feel like, you know, if McCabe gets, we get close with McCabe or Hillary or anybody, that the distraction would be a perfect reason for the... Uh, well, the only reason I would say that that wouldn't happen is because the commander-in-chief is Donald Trump. Listen, I, I know everybody's afraid. Uh, oh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump is following in the footsteps of Reagan, the evil empire. And he's not going to bow down and kiss the ring or the backside of any two bit murdering dictator. And he's not going to give them billions and say, please, please, please stop saying you want to annihilate us and wipe us off the planet. It's, it's called peace through strength. And it is something that works. All right, that's going to wrap things up for today. Special edition Hannity tonight. So the president is going to make his corrupt fake news media awards announcement on Monday. And we're kind of getting a little ahead of the curve. We're going to give you, well, not only our choices, but your choices and your opportunity to weigh in. All right. So that's a special edition. How corrupt the media in America is an informational crisis. Nine Eastern. You won't believe the tape we put together. Nine Eastern Hannity Fox News. Have a great weekend. We'll see you tonight. We'll see you back. Back here on Monday, Tick Tock.